All right. So this morning message is going to be just a little bit different. Uh, we're going to do a little topical uh, message. We'll use a passage of scripture to help support the topic. Um, not something I typically do very often. I like to preach exegetically, which just means to preach through the scriptures and to go verse by verse. And we'll continue that um, probably in the next uh, week or so. Um, but the Lord laid upon my heart something specific this week. And I think it's important, especially at this time, especially at this that, at this point in time where we see a great opportunity for renewal, namely, namely that it's the the beginning of the year. And and if you uh, if you have a car right and you're driving it down the road, you, sometimes you know when when you're approaching those numbers on the odometer, you kind of keep an eye on it, right? There's there's something really neat about an odometer on a car rolling from nine 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 nine, right? To watch it all to just flip over to zero, right? You know what I'm talking about? Right? You're just rolling down the highway. You're at like one ninety nine 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 nine, just to see it flip over to two zero 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 zero, zero right? There's just a reset involved with that. That is just so like pleasing to see, right? It's it's just a maybe maybe I'm just the weird one who likes to see that or something. But but you know what I'm talking. There's this there's this rollover. You've gone through everything beforehand to get to that one point where it looks like you're about to start anew, and that's kind of what New Year's is, right? It's an opportunity for us to kind of rethink what happened last year and to kind of come to the new year with maybe a plan that has been shifted a little bit based on what we've learned the previous year. And we often talk about this in terms of a New Year's resolution. Now, <clears throat> I'm not against New Year's resolutions. I think they're great. I've made a couple myself, right? I'm, I'm getting a little bit weighty here. And so uh, I, I'd like to drop a few pounds, maybe eat a little bit healthier. So I'm making a New Year's resolution there. But that doesn't mean that the New Year's resolution is all in all. But what I want to talk about today is specifically making resolutions, but not just resolutions. I want to talk specifically about making God-glorifying resolutions, right? Because we can make resolutions on our own, and they can miss the mark. Or we can make a resolution that will glorify God. And even as I stand up here and talk about a resolution to lose weight or eat healthy, the question is, is not do I want to be healthy? Absolutely, I want to be healthy. Everybody here wants to be healthy. That's no question. But the question is, is how does that resolution bring glory to God? <clears throat> now, we're no strangers to... Uh, to resolutions, and neither was the early church. Um, I like to, to pick out a specific individual here uh, from the early 17th, uh, sorry, from the early 1700s, a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Now, he was a, a revivalist preacher in the, uh, in the uh, early Reformation period, a revivalist preacher. In fact, he had a, a significant amount of work he was doing in the, in the first great awakening. Now, as Pentecostals, we tend to not look beyond uh, Azusa Street, Right? We, all, we know all about Azusa Street and, and, and how the gift of the Spirit was poured out so amazingly uh, and, and how the, you know, the Pentecostal church kind of had its, its, its spring out, right? But there was so much more that happened before that. There were many great revivals that had happened before that. And Jonathan Edwards took part in this great awakening. We call it the first great awakening, which saw a return of the Lord specifically in Britain and in the colonies. And God was magnified and, and holiness was like the center stage in repentance and stuff. Now, now Jonathan Edwards, born October 5th, 1703, died in 1758. Ironically, he died to complications due to a smallpox vaccination. Uh, not saying anything about whether or not to get vaccinated. I just found that interesting, uh, especially in the debate in today's day and age. But he's most famous <clears throat> for writing a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I don't know if you've heard of that sermon. If you haven't, I want you to go Google it maybe later today and, and either find a recording of it or read it. It's a powerful sermon, and it will, it will light a fire under your butt to live for God. It truly will. I, I, I mean, it's not scripture. It's not inspired. But man, it is a powerful sermon. 
but it would not be a good thing to just end there because script, scriptures are, the scriptures are not just about sinners in the hands of an angry God. But you see, Jonathan Edwards wrote a second sermon called Heaven is a World of Love as sort of the antithesis of his first sermon. And again, it's another, it's another sermon worth its weight in gold. Go and read it and look at it after uh, the message this morning. You will find it to be worthwhile. Now, I was saying that Jonathan Edwards was, was kind of like forwarding one of these great revival movements. And Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that sermon, was one of those sermons that kind of had a pivotal point in the history of that revival. <clears throat> now, it's interesting to note the first time he preached that sermon, he preached it twice. The first time he preached it was in his home congregation. And it didn't fall. It didn't fall as we all know it today. It fell rather flat. And, you know, there was some response, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything crazy. But the second time, the second time he spoke, he spoke as a guest pastor somewhere. And there was an expectation on the people who were already there. See, the Holy Spirit had already fallen on these people. And when Jonathan Edwards got up and preached that sermon, people were literally gripping the pillars of the church in fear for the stuff that he was preaching. They were gripping them in fear that the very God of heaven would reach down and strike them into hell right then and there. And people got saved. People got saved. You read it in the history books. It's absolutely phenomenal what the Lord did through this sermon. And I find it interesting. We can take this little bunny trail. We got a little bit of time. <clears throat> but I find it interesting that the first time he preached it fell flat. But the second time, you know why it didn't fall flat? Not because he preached it better. Not because he took some notes from the first time and figured out where he could speak it a little bit nicer. No, it worked the second time because the Holy Spirit was there. And that's going to be the key. That's going to be the key to what we're talking about today. Resolutions, making resolutions, following through with resolutions. The Holy Spirit has to be in it. Now, why am I talking about Jonathan Edwards if we're talking about resolutions? Because what he's most famous for is he's most famous for his 70 resolutions. As a young teenager, Jonathan Edwards came up with 70 resolutions, things that he would resolve to do as a believer, things that he would adhere to or, or, or try to obtain. This was 70 items. And he wrote them all out in his very early years. And I, I took a sampling of uh, four of them just so you could get an idea of, of what he resolved, what young Jonathan Edwards would resolve himself to do. The first one was resolved to study the scriptures so steadily, constantly, and frequently as that I may find a plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. He was a spiritually minded man. So his resolutions would want to see him have spiritual growth. Another one, to maintain the wisest and healthiest practices in my eating and drinking. Now, we can all relate to that one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, the 1700s weren't much different from today. And this third one here that I picked out was, to be strictly and firmly faithful to whatever God entrusts to me. My hope is that the saying in Proverbs 26, a faithful man who can find, may not be found to be even partly true of me. So the fourth item here, the fourth, the fourth one I selected was, he says, I will endeavor always to keep a gracious demeanor and air of acting and speaking in all places and in all companies, except if it should so happen that faithfulness requires otherwise. Do you see his attitude here? Jonathan Edwards' attitude toward holy living, godly living, God glorifying living. And these come out in his resolutions. Now, he didn't make these resolutions as, as a New Year's thing, as we are thinking about today. But I think it's an important exercise to at least go through some, some of the things that you, as a believer, want to live out. And that's kind of like the purpose of a resolution. Now, the world who does not know Christ will resolve to do things well on their own strength for their own reasons. But you see, when we resolve to do things, we resolve to do them for specific reasons. Now, it could be uh, 
Maybe we want to steward our money a little better, right? Maybe we want to spend a little bit wiser and and not uh, and be a little bit more frugal. Uh, you know, lose weight and eat better. A really popular New Year's resolution or res- resolutions, uh, resolutions. Uh, a fun fact is apparently the sales of uh, exercise equipment tends to skyrocket in January and then fade off by February. And then the, <laughs> and then by March, the used market for <laughs> exercise equipment tends to go up. <clears throat> uh, maybe you're going to resolve to be more productive uh, or perhaps to improve your spiritual life, reading the Bible. A good resolution is to read the Bible this year, 2023. I did some math and discovered it it takes about 70 hours worth of reading time to read through cover to cover the Bible. So if you read it, if you read half an hour a day, that's 140 days, that's six months, just quick, quick estimate. Uh, Maybe that's a good one. Uh, Read through the Bible or pray, to pray every day. Maybe that's a resolution. There's a good resolutions, but there's a couple of things we need to talk about. But the other thing I want to do is I want to put like a quick reality check when we talk about New Year's Eve resolutions. Hey, here's, here's the reality check. Only 9% of people who make resolutions follow through with them. Only 9%. There's about 15 people in here. So that means uh, one and a half years. <laughs> about one and a half years are going to fulfill your entire resolution. Now, that's not, I'm not saying that to destroy your hope of completing a New Year's resolution. Uh, In fact, the reason why I'm preaching this today is because I want to encourage you that if you make a resolution before God, that you do have the ability and the power to keep that resolution. We spent a lot of time talking about Jonathan Edwards, but, you know, I'm a preacher of the Bible in a church, and we're not going to exegete Jonathan Edwards, but rather what we're going to do is we are going to exegete the scriptures. So if you have your Bible with you, uh, please turn with me to Romans chapter 7. And stand with me as we read through verses 14 to 20. The Apostle Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is not it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You may be seated. I like this passage because it's instantly relatable. It's instantly relatable. As I'm reading that, as you're standing there listening to the words of the scriptures, you're probably thinking in your minds like, man, I understand the problem that Paul is having here. Paul doesn't want to do certain things, and yet he he does them. He, he wants to do some things, and yet doesn't find the strength to be able to do them. Now, there's a specific context to this passage, and, and the context of this passage is, is living in righteousness. We're going to make a link to the resolutions in that in just a moment, but we need to understand that this passage is talking about living in righteousness, And the book of of Romans sets out a very specific, very logical-minded way of giving us the salvation story. He starts off with the wrath of God in chapter 1 and 2 and 3, and then he goes on to to faith in chapter 4 and 5. 6, he gives us the the link between the law and death and sin and death. And and, uh, and then in chapter 7 here, he expresses the hopelessness of trying to keep the law through your own means. And this, this is what he's talking about here, this thing that we so relate to, that if we try under our own power to fulfill the law of God, we would not be able to do so. This is what necessitated, this is what made it a need for Jesus to come. Because we couldn't fulfill the law of God 
He needed to fulfill the law for us. And that's what Jesus did and made a way that we could go to heaven. We know that. This is pretty standard Christian truth. This is like, this is like foundational level truth. You, you need to understand this first in order to be a Christian. That your inability to keep the law of God is what necessitated Jesus to come and die on the cross. It's required. It's base level faith. It's important. I mention it just about every Sunday up here on the pulpit because it's so important. We should never move away from these foundations. But I find it interesting because this is the, the Apostle Paul who's talking in this way. And uh, if, we, if we look at uh, Galatians, he tells us a bit about himself. He writes of himself, I, I have advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. In other words, you know, Paul is the guy. He's like, he's the Jew of the Jews. He's, he's, the, he's the guy. He can do it. If anybody could fulfill the law, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Right? Philippians Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. Let me read them here. Paul says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. So he's talking about his ability to work it out in Judaism. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. See, Paul is saying, like, I was there, guys. I was the guy. I could have done it. Although he couldn't have done it. And I'm sure there's, there's a little bit later about that. But here's where I want to go with this is when we talk about resolutions and, and New Year's resolutions, we find here Paul, the, the, the Jew of the Jews, himself, he couldn't even do what he wanted to do. He couldn't even will himself to keep the commands of God. Right? And even if Paul, our example, imitate me as I imitate Christ, that's Paul. Even if Paul, as our example, couldn't fulfill the law, Right? The question goes is, how are we going to expect to fulfill our own resolutions? See, Jonathan Edwards, let's go back to him for a minute. He kind of had this realization. In fact, he stopped writing resolutions uh, in his mid-20s because he came to a realization. This is later on in one of Jonathan Edwards' journals. He writes this. The last week I was sunk so low... <clears throat> that I fear it will be a long time before I am recovered. I fell exceedingly low in the weekly account regarding my resolutions. I find my heart so deceitful that I am almost discouraged from making any more resolutions. Wherein have I been neglect negligent in the week past? And how could I have done better to help the dreadful low estate in which I am sunk? See, even Jonathan Edwards, great revivalist, couldn't fulfill his own resolutions. So if Paul couldn't fulfill the law of God, and Jonathan Edwards couldn't even fulfill his resolutions, what hope do we have that we will be able to fulfill our resolutions? Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but seriously, these great men of the faith can't even find it within themselves to fulfill their own resolutions. But there is hope. But there is hope. Okay, so what I want to talk about is, is when we make our resolutions, how are we making our resolutions? What do we have in mind? Right, just because... The world says 9% of people fulfill their resolutions. But see, there, there's, there's a, a, a thing to consider when making your resolutions. I titled this sermon, I titled it, Making God-Glorifying Resolutions. Because here's why. When you make your resolutions, when you make them God-Glorifying, you've just increased the chances of fulfilling your resolution for the year. And I'll tell you why. When you're making resolutions, your motivation matters. What motivates you 
to do the things you do, right? As Christians, what motivates you to live righteously? What motivates you to live in holiness, right? It's Jesus. Jesus motivates us, right? Jesus said that we love him because he first loved us, right? His love motivates us to show our love in obedience, right? So the same thing with your, with your resolutions. Why are you making your resolutions? Okay. I have a, because I want to be healthy in like camel case. That's where you put like capital letters and lower letters, you know, because I want to be healthy, right? It's good. Like it's good to be healthy, but I want to be healthy. What's the problem with that? Right? It's, it's, it's intrinsically selfish, right? I'm making a resolution because I want to be better. I'm making a resolution because I just want to have more money. I'm making a resolution because I just want to feel happy. See, the Christian faith is not one of selfishness. The Christian faith is a call to selflessness. The Christian faith is called to take up your cross and walk, not to find the most comfortable place and sit down. Take up your cross. It's a selfless belief system. Christ urges us to consider others before ourselves. But even before then, we consider first and foremost God. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, the context here, it's about food sacrifice to idols and stuff of that nature, right? And some people will eat it and some people won't. And Paul is just saying, listen, like just whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. And so that's why he's specifically saying to whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. But I like how he adds that that parenthetical phrase in there, whatever you do or whatever you do. Now, this, this isn't like a, a thing to give you permission to do whatever you want to do as long as you can do it to the glory of God. No, he's not saying that. But he's saying that there are things that you're going to do in life that I haven't talked about. And those things that you do, do them to what? The glory of God. Do them to the glory of God. So when you make your resolution this year, Right? Make your resolution out to the effect, to the glory of God. What greater thing can you resolve to do but to do something for God's glory? You say, I want to lose weight. Well, I'll lose weight to the glory of God. Why? Not because you're going to be healthy. That's true and good. Why? Because when you're healthy and when you're full of energy, how much more effective is your ministry to the Lord going to be? to the glory of God. You say, I'm going to eat better so that I feel better. But if you eat better, you're going to have more energy. If you eat better, you're going to be up and, and, and vibrant and full of life. And if you're full of life, then how much more will your ministry glorify God? You say, I don't have a ministry. That's not true. Every one of you has a ministry. Every one of you has an opportunity to speak the good news to people, to comfort somebody who needs comfort. Every single one of you. Now, wouldn't it be a shame that if you had an opportunity and you couldn't take it because you were too tired because of whatever? But that's why we make the resolution. A resolution isn't something you have to do like as a biblical thing. I think it's a good practice to look back and to resolve certain things. But we do it for the glory of God. Now, to the degree that you value God's glory is the degree to which this first step will help you in keeping your resolution. If you value God's glory up here, you bet you will move heaven and earth to make sure you get that resolution down. But if you value God's, can't do it here because you can't see me behind this big wooden pulpit. But if you value God's glory like down here, that's going to have an effect on how you view the importance of your resolution. I like to put it this way. <clears throat> if somebody came to you and said, I saw your resolution, and if you keep it right to the end of 2023, I will give you $10 million, right? How many of you can keep that resolution, right? I mean, that would be pretty easy to keep the resolution for $10 million, right? Now, what do you weigh more? 
$10 million or God's glory? What do you weigh more? That's a tough question. Really think about it. But if you can weigh God's glory more than that and apply that to keeping your resolution, you keep your resolution. Guaranteed it. So second thing to help you in keeping your resolutions, renewing your mind daily. See, there is a weakness to the New Year's resolution. There is a weakness to it. Okay, the biggest weakness of a New Year's resolution is that you do them once a year, (laughs) right? You do them once a year. That's nowhere near enough to be effective in keeping something that you are committed to do. You need to revisit that constantly. You need to revisit that daily, daily. You need to think about what you're doing that's glorifying God. You need to think about this God-glorifying resolution, and you need to consider it daily. How am I doing with this? Bring it before the Lord in prayer continually. Romans 12.1, we know this passage. It's one of my favorites. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and... Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, I'm willing to bet that most of us, especially as Christians, when we make a resolution, it's often going to be a resolution that is to take us from some place in our lives that is more conformed to the world and to take that and conform it to God's word. And so in order to do that, we need to renew our minds. Now, it doesn't specifically say daily in this passage here, but it's definitely daily. You cannot go a day in your life without getting stained by sin. And when you get stained by sin, you need to renew your mind to clear it. And you need to come before the Father and confess. And you need to do this on a very, very regular basis. And so when it comes to succeeding in your resolution, which if it's a God-glorifying resolution, will be an enhanced life of holiness and righteousness, right? If you renew your mind daily, it will help. In number three, We have four, but the the fourth one is a little bit different here. But number three is this. You need to rely on the Lord for your strength and not yourself. (laughs) You need to rely on the Lord for your strength. Now, this is something that Jonathan Edwards had finally come to realize. I didn't write down the the excerpt from his journal here, but he finally realized that that these resolutions that he had been making, they, they were all well and good, but unless the Holy Spirit had empowered him to live them out, he would not be able to live them out in the least. And so he wrote that in his journals. He understood this. The resolutions were good insofar as they went. But unless the Holy Spirit had empowered him to keep them, he wouldn't be able to do so. See, this is the whole context of our passage in Romans 7. Is that even though we want to do good, we we can't do good. The whole idea of being a Christian is that our inability to do good things requires us to receive an external source to do those good things. And that external source is the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to live righteously. And insofar that we make a God-glorifying resolution, he will empower us to keep that resolution. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3. Verse 2 to 4, we're going back to Paul here. He says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So what's Paul saying here? He's saying here, you accepted the Holy Spirit by faith. You became a Christian by faith. 
And then what happened in the Galatian church is they, they turned around and started deciding that they were going to receive extra holiness by keeping the commands of the law. The Judaizers came in and tried to convince them not to work based on faith, but to work based on works. And Paul is saying you started off in faith and now you ended up here. How can that be? And that's for us today as believers when we consider our 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 resolutions don't stop believing that's so funny don't stop believing stay in the faith and bring that faith over to your resolution okay try to do your resolution through faith not through an act of will of the flesh because you will not be able to do it you need the strength of the lord to fulfill your god glorifying resolution how did you get saved? You got saved by faith. That's what this passage is talking about. And how do you keep going? You keep going through faith. And so if we see our God-glorifying resolution as a way of walking in Christ, then we need to walk in faith. Now, it's really important to understand why I keep saying your God-glorifying resolution your God-glorifying resolution. Because you can just make any old resolution. You can just make up in your mind what to do. See, the, 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 risk, the risk of doing New Year's resolutions, the risk of doing them is that you begin to see them as a set of rules that you put upon yourself that if you don't do these rules, then, then, then that's it. Right? But the reason why I call them God-glorifying resolutions is because, because those don't become rule-based. There is no risk in doing something for the glory of God. I mean, there's a different type of risk. Sometimes doing things for the glory of God looks a bit silly and might get you into a little bit of trouble or whatever it is. Doing things for the glory of God is sometimes a little bit uncomfortable. There's, there's, there's that kind of risk, but, but I don't mean a risk of, of, of doing something wrong, right? If you have a God glorifying resolution, you're not going to do anything wrong. Your God-glorified resolution is going to be based on the scriptures, is going to be based on a godly walk with the Lord. And so it will not end up being a set of rules that we must complete in order to be saved, right? Our resolutions don't save us. Our works don't save us. We know that. And finally, the fourth item here, if you fail in your resolution, it's not the end of the world. Praise the Lord. If you fail in your resolution, don't condemn yourself over it. <clears throat> if it's a God-glorifying resolution, you know what happens? You recognize that as a good thing. Oftentimes, our resolution is, is based on some sin or some habit or something that we've been doing. If that's the case, right? You, you get up, you, you repent. You repent and you start over again. You start over again. Okay, but there's no need to condemn yourself over a failed resolution. I'm sure there will be times throughout the year where we will miss a part of our resolution, but get back up and get and do it again. Remember, if you're renewing your resolution daily, you'll know to get back up and to do it again. If you're relying on the Lord for strength, he will help you get back up and do it again. And if your motivation is to glorify God, you will get back up and do it again. These are three key things when it comes to your New Year's resolutions. And so I would encourage you that if you're going to make resolutions this year, again, I've made a few resolutions. And I know resolutions aren't specifically biblical or anything like that. But if you are going to make a resolution this year. Keep these three things in mind. Let me repeat them again. Do them for God's glory. Renew your mind daily and rely on the Lord for strength to complete your resolutions. Okay? Keep those in your mind. Pray on them. Consider them. Think of them and you will have a successful time doing your resolutions. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for this year. We thank you for the new year upon us, Lord. 
Lord, and for those of us that you have put a resolution on our heart or perhaps something in our hearts to, to change this year or something that you've been guiding us toward, we pray that you would give us courage to do that. Lord, we ask that you would help us to keep our God-glorifying resolutions. Lord, if our resolutions aren't, aren't, aren't glorifying to you, Lord, we pray that you would reveal that to our hearts so we could change that to glorify you, Lord. We pray that you would help us to renew our minds daily, to renew them in prayer, to renew them in your word, Lord. We pray that you would renew and have our, our uh, resolutions before us continually, Lord, that we, would be, that we would know and be reminded of the thing that we want to do to glorify you the most. Lord, we, we pray and ask that you would help us most importantly to give us your strength to do these deeds. We pray, Lord, that you would give us strength this year, Lord. We pray that you would give us a vision for this year. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would cause us to really reach out, Lord, and to share your good news around us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that in our resolutions this year, that you would be glorified. And we ask, God, that you would continue to move in us as you have. And we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.